Section 29, page 143. Chapter 21. The small bright lawn stretched away smoothly to the big bright sea. The turf was humped with an edge of scarlet geranium and clouds, and cast iron vases painted in chocolate color, standing at intervals along the winding path that lead to the sea looped their gardens of petunia and ivy geranium above the neatly raked gravel. Halfway between the edge of the cliff and the square wooden house, in parentheses, which was also chocolate-colored, but with the tin roof of the veranda stripped in yellow and brown to represent an awning. Two large targets had been placed against a background of shrubbery. On the other side of the lawn, Facing the targets was pitched a real tent, with benches and garden seats about it. A number of ladies in summer dresses and gentlemen in grey frock coats and tall hats stood on the lawn or sat upon the benches, and every now and then a slender girl in stretched muslin would step from the tent, bob in hand, and speed her shout at one of the targets, while the spectators interrupted their talk to watch the result. Newland Arker, standing on the veranda of the house, looked curiously down upon the scene. On each side of the shiny painted steps was a large blue china flower pot on a bright yellow china stand. A spiky green plant filled each pot, and below the veranda ran a white border of blue hydrangeas edged with more red geraniums. Behind them, the French windows of the drawing rooms, through which he had passed, gave, gave glimpses. Between swaying lace curtains of glossy parquet floors, islanded with chintz puffs, doors, armchairs, and velvet tables covered with trifles in silver. The Newport Archery Club always held its August meeting at the Beforts. The sport, which had hitherto now no rival but coquette, was beginning to be discarded in favor of lawn tennis but the latter game was still considered too rough and inelegant for social occasions, and as an opportunity show of pretty dresses and graceful attitudes, the bow and arrow held their own. Archer looked down with the wonder at the familiar spectacle. It surprised him that the life should be going on in the old way when his own reactions to it had so completely changed. It was Newport that had first brought home to him the extent of the change. In New York, during the previous winter, after he and May had settled down in the new greenish yellow house with the bow window and the pompeian vestibule, he had dropped back with relief into the old routine of the office, and the renewal of this daily activity had served as a link with his former self. Then there had been the pleasurable excitement of choosing a showy grey stepper for May's brougham. In parentheses, the villains had given the carriage, and the abiding occupation and interest of arranging his new library, which, in spite of family dubs and disapprovals, had been carried out as he dreamed, with a dark embossed paper, east lake bookcases and sincere armchairs and tables. At the century he had found Vincent again, and at the knickerbocker the fashionable young man of his own set, and while and what with the horse dedicated to love, and those given to dining out or entertaining friends at home, with an occasional evening at the opera or the play. The life he was living had still seemed a fairly real and inevitable sort of business. But Newport represented the escape from duty into an atmosphere of unmitigated holiday-making. Arker had tried to pursue May to spend the summer on a remote island of the coast of Maine, in parentheses, called, abruptly enough, Mount Desert. Very few hardy Bostonians and Philadelphians were camping in native cottages, and once came reports of enchanting scenery and a wild, almost trapper-like existence amid woods and water. But the Valens always went to Newport, where they owned one of the square boxes on the cliffs, and their son-in-law could adduce no good reason why he and May should not join them there. As Mrs. Valent rather tartly pointed out, 
It was hardly worthwhile for me to have worn herself a train on summer clothes in Paris if she was not to be allowed to wear them, and this argument was of a kind to which Arger had as yet found no answer. May herself couldn't understand his obscure reluctance to fall in with so reasonable and pleasant a way of spending the summer. She reminded him that he had always liked the import in his bachelor days, and as this was indisputable, he could only profess that he was sure he was going to like it better than ever now that they were to be there together. But as he stood on the Beaufort veranda and looked out on the brightly peopled lawn, it came home to him with a shiver that he wasn't going to like it at all. It was a May's fault, poor dear, if, now and then, during their travels, they had fallen slightly out of step. Harmony had been restored by their return to the conditions she was used to. He had always foreseen that she would disappoint him, and he had been right. He had married, in parentheses, as most young men did, because he had met a perfectly charming girl at the moment, when a series of rather aimless sentimental adventures were ending in premature disgust, and she had rep represented pace, stability, comradeship, and the steadying sense of unescapable duty. He couldn't say that he had been mistaken in his choice, for she had fulfilled all that he had expected. It was undoubtedly gratifying to be the husband of one of the handsomest and most popular young married women in New York, especially when she was also one of the sweetest tempered and most reasonable of wives. Anarcher had never been insensible to such advantages. As for the momentary madness which had fallen upon him on the eve of his marriage, he had trained himself to regard it as the last of his discarded experiments. The idea that he could ever, in his senses, have dreamed of marrying the Countess Alanska had become almost unthinkable, and she remained in his memory simple as the most plaintive and poignant of the line of gods. But all these abstractions and eliminations made of his mind a rather empty and echoing place, and he supposed that was one of the reasons why the busy animated people on the Beaufort lawn shocked him as if they had been children playing in a graveyard. He heard a murmur of skirts beside him, and the Marchioness Manson fluttered out the driving room window. As usual, she was extraordinarily festooned and bedenized with a limp leghorn hat, anchored to her head by many winding of faded gloves and a little black velvet parasol on a carved ivory handle absurdly balanced over her much larger hat brim. My dear Neland, I had no idea that you and May had arrived. You yourself came only yesterday, you say. Ah, business, business professional duties, I understand. Many husbands, I know, find it impossible to join their wives here except for the week and she cocked her head on one side and languished at him through secret up eyes. But marriage is one look sacrifice, as I used often to remind my Ellen. Arker's heart stopped with the cure jerk which it had given once before, and which seemed suddenly to slam a door between himself and the outer world. But this break of continuity must have been of the briefest, for he presently heard Madara answering a question he had apparently found voice to put. No, I am not staying here, but with the Blankers in their delicious solitude at Portsmouth. Beaufort was kind enough to send his famous tutors for me this morning, so that I might have at least a glimpse of one of Regina's garden parties. But this evening I go back to rural life. The Blankers, dear original beings, have hired a primitive old farmhouse at Portsmouth where they gather about them, representative people. She dropped slightly beneath the, her protecting brim and added with a faint blush, This week Dr. Egerton Carver is holding a series of inner thought meetings there. I contrast indeed to this gay scene of worldly pleasure, but then I have always lived on contrasts. To me the only that is monotony. I always say to Ellen, beware of monotony, it is the mother of all the deadly sins, 
but my poor child is going through a phase of exaltation, of abhorrence of the world, you know, I suppose, that she has declined all invitations to stay at Newport, even with her grandmother Mingot. I could hardly pursue her to come with me to the Blankers. If you will believe it, the life she leads is morbid, unnatural. Ah, if she had only listened to me when it was possible, when the door was still open. But shall we go down and watch this absorbing match? I hear your maid is one of the competitors. Strolling towards them from the tent, before it advanced over the lawn, tall, heavy, too tightly buttoned into London frock coat, with one of his own orchids in its buttonhole. Harker, who had not seen him for two or three months, was struck by the change in his appearance. In hot summer, light of his floridness seemed heavy and bloated, and but for his erect square shouldered bulk, he would have looked like an overfed and overdressed old man. There were all sorts of rumors afloat about Beaufort. In the spring, he had gone off a long curious to the West Indies in his new stream yacht, and it was reported that, at various points where he had touched, a lady resembling Miss Fennering had been seen in his company. The stream yacht, built in the Clyde, and fitted with tiled bathrooms and other unheard-of luxuries, was said to have cost him half a million, and the pearl necklace which he had presented to his wife on his return was as magnificent as such expiatory offerings he are apt to be. Beaufort's fortune was substantial enough to the send the strain, and yet the distinct rumors persisted, not only in the Fifth Avenue but in the Wall Street. Some people said he had speculated unfortunately in railways, others that he was being bled by one of the most insatiable members of her profession. And to every report of threatened insolvency, Beaufort replied by a fresh extra extravagance, the building of a new row of orchid horses, the purchase of a new string of racehorses, or the addition of a new messenger or cabinet to the his picture gallery. He advanced toward the Marchioness and Newland, with his usual half-sneering smile. Hola, Medara, did the traitors do their business? Forty minutes, sir. Eh? Well, that's not so bad, considering your nerves had to be spared. He shook hands with Arker, and then, turning back with them, placed himself on Mrs. Manson's other side, and said in a low voice a few words which their companion didn't catch. The Marchioness replied by one of her queer foreign jerks, and a hula which deepened Beaufort's frown, but he produced a good semblance of a congratulatory smile as he glanced at Arker to say, You know, May's going to carry off the first prize. Ah, then it remains in the family, Mother rippled. And at that moment they reached the tent, and Mrs. Beaufort met them in a girlish cloud of novel muslin and floating veils. May Valent was just coming out of the tent, in her white dress, with a pale green ribbon about the waist and red of ivy on her hat. She had the same Diana-like aloofness as when she had entered the Beaufort ballroom on the night of her engagement. In the interval, not a thought seemed to have passed behind her eyes or a feeling through her heart. And though her husband knew that she had the capacity for both, he marveled afresh at the way in which experience dropped away from her. She had her bow and arrow in her hand, and placing herself on the chalmark traced on the turf, she lifted the bow to her shoulder and took aim. The attitude was so full of classic grace that a murmur of appreciation followed her appearance, and Arker felt the glow of proprietorship that so often cheated him into a monumentary well-being. Her rivals, Mrs. Reggie Shivers, the Mary Girls and Divers Rossi Tordays, Daganets and Mingots, stood behind her in a lovely, anxious group, round hats and golden band above the scars, and pale muslins and flower-red hats mingled in a tender rainbow. All were young and pretty, and waited in the summer bloom, but not one had the nymph-like ease of his wife, one, with tense muscles and happy frown, she bent her soul upon some feet of strength. God, Arker heard Lawrence Lefford say, 
not one of the lot holds the bow as she does. And Beford retorted. Yes, but that's the only kind of target she will ever hit. End of the section. Page 148.